So let me introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Damla Torgut is an associate professor actually in the University of Central Florida. And she is coming here from US to give us her interesting actually talk, which will be titled Challenges of IoT, the expected and unforeseen actually challenges. Hope you will enjoy it. Thank you, Damla, for coming. And a brief bio about Damla. She received her BS and MS and PhD degrees from Computer Science and Engineering Department of University of Texas. Uh, her, her research is mainly in wireless uh, communications, wireless ad hoc networks, sensors, and cloud computing, Internet of Things. So she is kind of a uh, wide uh, researcher, wide domain researcher. We appreciate her coming again. She got lots of uh, test paper awards. She had lots of uh, interesting research in different conferences, different uh, top tier journals as well. Uh, she got the IEEE ICC Best Paper Award, I think, 2013. And she had some other also Best Paper Awards. I don't have the time to mention all of them, but I can say that she is one of the marvelous talkers. Actually, usually she joins us every year for LCN. And I wish you will enjoy the talk that she will give. I'm sure I trust that you will enjoy it. And I will leave you now with Damla Torgut. I will open the floor for you. Thank you, Bonnie, for such a kind introduction. I'll do my best to, uh, <laughs> for that. Um, okay, so good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to, before we start, actually, uh, this LCN is very special for me. I've been a uh, part of the organizing committee for several, several years. It's that wonderful coming back. It's like a family getting together. So I'm so happy to see all familiar faces. I'm always happy to meet new people uh, as I uh, join LCN uh, for almost the last uh, 10 years. Um, so this morning, uh, I um, and also one other thing is that actually uh, LCN is the conference that I actually managed to travel to Asia for the first time in my life. I've never been to Asia before, so yay to LCN for actually making me make that 30 hour flight, which apparently that I can. <laughs> All right, so uh, this morning I would like to um, start talking about, uh, I mean I think uh, this is a room full of networking researchers and all of you know what IoT is about. Um, and what, you know, where it comes from and what has been happening recently, you know, for the last several years. But I thought I'll try to give a little bit of, um, you know, go back and kind of talk about what were the, some of the things that when IoT came in, what are the things that we expected, what are the challenges we expected and we were able to solve, and what are some of the challenges that we did not expect and we still, uh, and we're struggling with, with solutions. And I'll try to give my own personal opinion um, you're more than welcome to challenge it. I'm, I'm always happy to have discussions about it. So I hope this would be a rather interactive discussion about where have, where is IoT have been, where we are going with this, what more can we do as an academic researchers. And of course, I see a lot of uh, industry folks around here, which I think are very key, um, you know, um, key players in making IoT a even more reality for for larger audiences. So with that, I will. Um, Okay, so basically we'll start with the vision of IoT, right? Um, so when IoT came, um, we were really, IoT meaning the Internet of Things, so we were basically looking to, um, we had all these objects around us, right? Day-to-day -day objects, and but we never really thought of them as, you know, we never think of them as actually being connected devices. We never thought of them like, as computers. But when the Internet of Things came in, we were like, okay, what if we can connect some of these objects into the Internet? So essentially, um, and of course, the reason for connecting them to the Internet was so that they can, we can actually improve them in some ways. Uh, actually, one of my colleagues yesterday was making fun of the shoes, and I thought I'll give that example today. Like, for instance, uh, what if we have a smart shoes instead of a regular shoes? What if we have a smart tea kettle instead of a regular tea kettle? Like, can we improve them? You know, because maybe they will actually provide us better functionality, and maybe they will provide us more longer time availability, or you know, maybe it will be it will you know make our lives faster, the performance, and it will make our lives easier in some ways or another, right? 
And so, so essentially, the, the next logical step for the evolution of the internet beyond computers, right? So, so essentially, now we have all these objects, let's connect them together, let's make them work for us in, in some ways. So, but the roots of IoT is actually, is, the, you know, IoT is really not a new thing, right? Because again, looking through the room, we have, I'm sure almost all of you have been, you know, involved in some of these previous um, visions of the computation, right? I mean, I think most of us have had some way of working in pervasive computing, ubiquitous computing, mobile computing, you know, different names. Um, and essentially, you know, IoT sort of came out from that. And But the, what's different with the IoT is that we are talking about the internet part, right? The focus is the internet. So we are really talking about the connectedness of the devices. So with the previous things, we were also concerned about the computation power. But with the IoT devices, we are not really that interested in computation of the devices themselves. We are not interested in really having to store a lot of information in those devices, perhaps, right? Because now we have cloud computing for that. You just they're kind of a means to you know sense the information maybe, but then you know upload it to a cloud or something, right? But with the IoT is really the idea is the connectedness of those devices that that it was not there before. So obviously, as the technology goes around, um, the IoT shares several similar characteristics and requirements from the previous areas since uh, 2000 and maybe even before 2000 really. And again, these are some of the different networks and I'm sure almost all of us had touch base, um, mobile networks, cellular networks, right? You know, again, talking about how we connect our cell phones and base stations and how to do the cell phone coverage. There were a lot of good researchers in there that accomplished and hot networks was there because we wanted to have a network that we can, you know, seamlessly connect, um, you know, come up with a network with devices that can, you know, form a network for a short duration of time, and then maybe later on we don't need it anymore, so then it goes away type of thing, right? Um, DOD had a lot of um, stake on that. Uh, sensor networks is another one. I think that's probably the IoT, current IoT researchers are generally are coming from, um, you know, places such as this. I mean, I personally, myself, have done a lot of ad hoc sensor network, and I still am doing that, and my dissertation was on ad hoc networking protocols, for instance. But the sensor networks, as we know, it's all about sensors. So we have a huge number of sensors dispersed in the area, right, and they are doing some sensing and for, for a given query, and after that sense data is actually collected, they can either do some local computation or they can even just basically forward the, the raw data to uh, some central unit later on, and so on and so forth, right? But as you can see, um, IoT gets its, you know, which, you know, its, uh, its roots from the already existing um, networks. So, and in fact, even the term was not very much new. It was, uh, it was actually came about in the late 1990s, and so if you, I thought that this was interesting because this was like literally 18 years ago, right? So if you can treat IoT as a human being, then that IoT would actually have the almost right, have a right to vote, right? That's, that's something. So now, what do we do with this, right? Now, so here's my, here's a little picture I think everyone knows, right? The Shrek. So this was the place where, you know, they were going to this, um, you know, castle, right? And uh, the donkey kept saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet, right? And then of course the answer was always, no, we're not there yet, right? So I thought this was interesting to say, are we there? You know, do we have the full potential of IoT yet, right? Uh, so that's, that's something that is interesting to, to think about, whether, where, where we have come from and, where, and, much more, and how much more we actually have to go with this particular research. So, um, and these are some of the things I'm gonna try to give some opinions and ideas and, and hopefully we can have some discussions about that. All right, um, so this is an interesting slide and I hope you enjoyed this because it's taken me a while to figure all these things. And again, these are some of the useless things that I think they're useless. So that you might, you might, some of you might find them somewhat useful, but for instance, pet view play, right? This is, the, this is a device where it actually allows you to play with your cat through a laser beam uh, remotely, right? How useful this is, right? Uh, <laughs> look at this one, right? So here is like, you know, you have this device in your mouth, you can actually talk uh, so privately, you know? You kinda, I mean, I don't know how many of you wanna wear this or look like this, I mean, I certainly don't, but you know, here you go, right? Um, 
this is the one I like, eye kettle, right? This is actually an electric kettle, and that actually allows you to remotely control your, your kettle in the house. Um, so basically, and that's like, I think, uh, almost 200 something pounds, and uh, it has, if you notice close, I'm not sure if you can see, but it, oops, sorry. It has um, two and a half star reviews with 175 reviews. So that's clearly a big time failure, failure um, IoT device, right? And again, I don't really blame them. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm even surprised people, even that many people actually bought that particular device, right? Oh, this is another one that I like so much. Look at that, right? So here you have the water bottle, half a full or whatever, I think was a 50%. So you have this, um, you know, it can actually see how much water you have in the bottle and your phone can tell you it is 50% full or 50% empty. Wow, that's, that's really great, right? So what an app. Um, how about this one? Chipping the never lost golf balls, right? So you can actually have, um, I don't know how many of you are golfers here. I am um, in Florida, we have huge golf courses. I happen to be living in a golfer community where you know people go golfing. But again, you know, how I mean how much is the golf balls worth? And you know, like looking into actually getting your um, you know, to find where your golf balls are. So as you can see, there are huge numbers, and these are nowhere near the numbers or, or, or any extent. These are just like some quick examples that I found, which I thought that it's not really worth buying these things. I mean, people, um, obviously companies will try to make money out of all these devices, but as a consumers, you know, we have to, I think, act smarter and, and actually use the, you know, um, this IoT in, in, in ways to improve our life in a more meaningful way, in my opinion. And then of course there's another, you know, useless things is one thing, but what about some of the things that are actually rather dangerous, right? For instance, the this is actually a reasonably new one, uh, Samsung Smart Fridge exposes Gmail login details. So basically you have to log in to your Gmail account, and so once you log into your Gmail account and the hackers is actually gets into your account and, you know, you're exposed, right? Uh, that's kind of scary, right? I mean, we all like smart things, love to have smart fridges, but we don't want to give away our personal information for, for a fridge telling us we need a milk, you know, uh, we're out of milk. Um, then you have like this one right here. So hackers would actually make the car wash attack, which is crazy, right? I mean, they can actually um, control these car washing jets and you know, all these things, and they can actually damage your car. They can remotely attack that and, and you know, so, you know, for those of us who doesn't want to painstakingly wash our cars at home, the car washes, but we can actually get our car damage coming out of that, which is kind of scary. Um, then, you know, most of the time when we think about security breaches, we think about small companies, you know, and not necessarily big companies, and how can these those bridging, you know, security breaches, but sometimes even the big companies could, um, could potentially have that. Like, for instance, Disney is currently being sued for spying on children through 42 gaming apps, right? That's kind of scary. It makes you think like, you know, we think about the games, right? I mean, we always think about our kids, which games they should be put on their cell phones or laptops and so on and so forth, right? And how many of you use AccuWeather, right? That's a very useful app, but it turns out that, you know, the even this particular app can actually, was actually called sending user location data, even when the user was specifically saying that, no, I do not want to share my location. So if they were caught actually people having their uh, location information. Uh, another one here is the IoT cameras, right? So obviously IoT cameras is a very useful thing. You can put IoT cameras all over your house. Uh, and I think even a lot of uh, my colleagues are actually not stuck paying their, you know, um, um, I don't know, the alarm systems and they just basically come up with their own security cameras and so on and so forth. But again, uh, these can be, you know, remotely hacked very, very easily. Uh, and many times it's because they sort of come with the, you know, uh, passwords and sometimes it's difficult to change and sometimes people forget to change passwords and so often and so that they can, you know, instead of like, you know, when you, when you have intentions of actually securing your house, you actually end up, uh, you know, losing a lot of privacy and whatnot. So uh, as you can see, IoT is not all that great, but uh, in terms of like not everything that IoT has done is great, so we just kind of have to be really careful about that. 
Um, so my talk is essentially about the challenges, as I mentioned. Uh, so I want to talk. Uh, I want to start talking about uh, what challenges were actually solved, right? Certainly, we have, in my opinion, we have solved certain challenges, which I feel like there's not so much interesting things anymore. Uh, but then there are still very much. I mean, there's still quite a few challenges remaining, and I want to. I want to talk about that. And another thing I was thinking, so who is responsible to solve these challenges? Are they solely falling the, the shoulders of academic researchers like ourselves or industry? Or is it the society or government as an all, right? I mean, the answer to that is kind of different, right? Because it depends where you live in the world. So for instance, I think I imagine um, the US is mostly going to be like those kind of things will be mostly sold by industry in some ways because, you know, um, but for instance, if you are in, maybe in Singapore in a country small like this, then you can probably, society and government might have a little bit more say about some of the rules and regulations and so on and so forth. And in, you know, and again, Europe has a different rules and US is a different rule. So, but I think in some ways, it, it is a responsibility of everybody in, in a way, it's just that depending on where you live in your in the world, it, the the responsibilities will change a little bit. Uh, but of course, as an academic researcher, I'm always interested in looking and, and trying to find some new challenges and opportunities and responsibilities that we can put our own contributions into this. So I hope I'll be able to give you some of those things to think about. Okay, um, so there were challenges we have foreseen. We kind of said, okay, this could be a challenge. And then of course those were, uh, some of them actually turned out to be a little easier than we thought. Wonderful, right? That's, that's great. And then some of them uh, we thought that may not be feasible or solvable, and they turned out to be solvable. Then again, that's another great for us. Uh, but then there were some challenges turned out to be much harder than we thought they were. And so those are the things we have to consider um, looking into. Uh, and then of course there are several challenges that we did not expect and probably some of us still don't think about them. But uh, in this particular talk, I want to uh, get into some of the some of each of these areas in a little bit more detail, like for instance, system problems. Uh, when we think about devices, uh, individually connecting to each other and, and they're connecting to the internet, there are a lot of problems, you know, system problems that we may not actually think about personally. And then there's also economic problems. As a computer science and engineering researcher, we, you know, do our academic work, but we don't think about really how is this affecting the economy. Uh, because again, in IoT, uh, in order for IoT to be successful, you have to have, everybody has to be winning in some ways. You have to have the customer happy with what they got. You have to have the companies happy about what they have to offer. So it has to be a win-win situation for some of these applications to work. In fact, I'm going to give you some more examples why some of these technologies, which turn out to be really good, but then because the customers uh, were not interested, and as a result, they actually failed it. Yeah. So, so those are some of the things that are is to think about. And, and another one is operation day two. Um, so <laughs> this is actually for me, I was thinking from the system administration perspective, okay, you know, day one is essentially, okay, now we put our uh, IoT, you know, we, you know, we got our IoT devices, they are now working, but then what happens after that? How do we maintain it? How do we do updating? How do we do patching of the systems and so on? So the following slides, I'm going to try to uh, dive into a little bit more in, into, in, into those. Okay, so uh, let's start with a positive note. Um, I, you know, and I want to start talking about what are the things that turn out to be easier than we thought. Um, I feel that personally, establishing communication between devices are generally solved issues, right? I mean, of course, some of you may or may not agree with me on this, but I think that's not a big problem anymore. And the reason it's not a big problem is because of the fact that um, we have all these technologies that were developed earlier like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and LT, which are not necessarily, by the way, were developed for IoT, obviously, right? I mean, Wi-Fi was developed for connecting our, you know, computers. You know, we had LT was mostly for, you know, telephony, mobile network type of things. And we had Bluetooth technology, which we really liked. It was essentially connecting your headset, you know, your, you know, Bluetooth to your phone, 
or you know, connecting your phone to your car and so on and so forth, right? And even the quality of the Bluetooth over the years has really increased tremendously. For instance, um, when I had my car, you know, nine years ago, I had this Bluetooth, and but recently it was just not working very well. And then when you get a new car, you realize, oh wow, the, now the Bluetooth works beautifully, much much better. So as you can see, even a few years, I mean, the technologies go wonderful. Um, so because of that, uh, I think because of the wonderful, the, the wonderful of these technologies, we were able to actually uh, do this connectivity uh, between different devices. Um, to internet much, much easier. I mean, this was almost impossible to do 30 years ago, right? But now it's really, really very easy. And because of the fact that we are in an environment where there's almost never an area where you don't have a Wi-Fi anymore, right? And, you know, it's blanketed with Wi-Fi devices and, and, and LTE. So, so in, in many ways, it's not, it's not, a, it's not much of an interest. Uh, another thing is about the naming and addressing, right? I mean, there was some scare that we were going to essentially run out of IPv4 uh, addresses, right? And, and obviously, if you look at the literature and what's going on currently, we are sort of partially moved into IPv6, but we are not really, we're not fully moved into that domain, right? So um, it turns out, though, the reason that because uh, we were worrying about the private address spaces, but it turned out that they, they were kind of relatively well, actually, at the end. Um, for instance, my university, University of Central Florida, has, I believe, 65,000 students, and, and we are actually working with private addresses. So if you can if you imagine that um, you know, a few years ago we were worrying about that, but it can actually it's not turned out to be that big of a problem. Okay, so um, put a bit more. Power consumption. Again, um, if you look into sensor networks, right? Earlier sensor network. Uh, idea where we throw sensors in the environment and those are small sensors that you know they, they have one single battery or maybe two batteries and then but after a while they kind of run out of power right so then all of a sudden you know all the researchers were thinking about okay how do we find uh, how do we develop protocols where we can actually optimize the power consumption right so that they can last longer and if each device in the network <coughs> lasts longer then you have your increase your network lifetime I mean, I think if you search network lifetime in the Google, you probably run into like thousands and thousands of papers, right? And uh, but for the if you if you look at actually IoT devices that are most compelling and really the most meaningful and useful, they actually turn out to be rather stationary, right? For instance, Google Home, Amazon Alexa. Uh, Nest terms that these are all essentially wired power devices, so the power consumption is no longer the issue anymore, right? And I know some of you have uh, houses uh, which are fully, you know, smart designs. For instance, Tim was just telling me that last night, so he got his whole house, smart house now. So, so with, with, with Amazon Alexa, which works beautiful, right? So then you don't really have to worry about your power consumption issue anymore. Uh, and for some of the others, actually, wireless charging is actually a possibility. So it's, again, power consumption issue is no longer that major we must solve type of issue. But now, having said that, please don't make me uh, make you think that you know all things are sold and there's nothing more to do, so it's, it's never the case. So there are actually, now that we got things working, just get things working doesn't mean that we're done, right? So we can always try to make sure they make them better, make them optimize further. So there's always that work in optimization. In fact, sometimes getting things working is easier than make them more improvement. So, so there is still some work um, to be done in that. Um, okay, so now let's move on to the challenges that we expected to be tough and they still are, right? Uh, so I put this night picture here because, I mean, we kind of expected things to be hard. We expected security to be hard. I mean, security is still a big deal and a big issue even, you know, in our day-to-day -day lives. Right? I mean, securing your computer, securing your uh, devices are, are definitely still a problem and it continues to be a problem. And obviously, with the IoT domain, that's sim similar problems and even more challenging issues remain and they were actually transferred to IoT domain. So. Um, so basically, obviously, um, with the IoT devices, 
the security issues is transferred, but sometimes you know there might be further, uh, more different uh, specific security issues that is related to specific to IoT in that in that sense. Uh, and I, it, and then of course the privacy is another thing in which I'm really interested and in, and in, in passionate about. You know, what about the privacy issues? I mean, all these devices are wonderful and everything, but then what happens to our privacy? Um, how do we, how much, I mean, are we able to actually control our privacy? How much privacy are we giving out when, I, when we are actually uh, deciding to use some of these uh, devices? Um, with the privacy, we did definitely, as a re, you know, academic researchers, we developed theoretical models and um, and we continue to do so, and it's a, it's a very challenging issue, right? Uh, because a lot of times the devices you want to use wants to have con you know have access to the entire everything you know like I am interested in this particular app but why does this app want to know my contacts you know I mean if you have an app that is going to help you find a location then of course your location has to be turned on but if you have a completely unrelated app wants to know your location wants to know contacts everything then you kind of you're like wondering why is it still right and so privacy is something I. I really think that there's a huge amount of uh, issues and, and we need to really uh, start educating ourselves and I think educating the, the uh, public about how to, you know, how to, how to know and how to give away uh, and for what value. And that's something I'm going to mention it about uh, value of privacy and, and value of information that we are um, providing for. Um, okay, so some of the unexpected challenges. So far we talked about challenges that we thought that is going to be there and solvable and, and now we are, and we also talked about challenges that were expected to be hard and they're still hard. And now let's look at some of the challenges that we did not really expect. Um, in my opinion, there's still like, for instance, there's no killer app, right, in IoT. Uh, or at least I think so. If you think there's a killer app, I'm more than happy to hear that. Um, also, I think there's a lot of consumer resistance. Uh, there are some there are some devices and applications that people are just not happy about, and they are some people are actually, um, you know, um, doing some extra amount of uh, effort to make sure those uh, technologies does not get succeeded, like for instance Google Glass. Um, Business model challenges, I think that's very important because um, the business model has to work. If the business model fails, then obviously that's not a good thing because then the customers are not going to buy your devices, the, you know, and the, you know, the, um, the companies who are making the devices are not going to be you know, um, profitable and all of those. So again, like I said, it has to be a win-win situation. It has to be a device that is perceived to be useful by the customer, perceived to be helping the customer needs as well as actually um, providing a benefit to the companies. Uh, then we're gonna talk about the day two problems here. So as I mentioned, there are things like systems. So we need a system, right, um, that can actually help us manage all these IT devices, right? Um, and then of course, when you're talking about a system, you're talking about all of a sudden competing systems, right? Everybody's competing with each other. Uh, like Google Home and, and Amazon Alexa, right? Those are competing systems among each other and so on and so forth. And I think another one is unpatchable, unpatchable IoT devices. And I think for me, that's also a major, major problem, right? But if you have an IT device that you have purchased and, uh, and then all of a sudden that company who actually provided that device is no longer available. So what do you do with it? I mean, do you just throw them all out and then start with a new device? Um, so, you know, we, we get all excited, but we don't think about like what happens, you know, can we still maintain this particular device if we, if we cannot patch it, if we cannot update it, if we cannot maintain it. Um, again, upgrade paths and some of the device obsolescence, right? Like, what if the device is no longer needed, right? What do you do um, with that? So, now the, all of these things make me think about the value, right? The problem of value. So, um, certainly we can connect many, many things to the internet, and we have done that. Uh, we can connect the teapots, the beds, the shoes, uh, the water bottles and all of that, but why? Why do we need to, I mean, obviously, this is a for a joke, we are connecting Apple to an internet, right? 
Okay, we can do it just because we can do it. Why should we do it? What value does it give us to do this, right? Um, and so again, what kind of value do we gain by doing that? What do we gain as a customer? What does the companies gain, right? So, so you really should have to think about the value of things and, and doing these things. Um, so now I'm going to start getting a little bit more detail into uh, some of the things that I mentioned earlier. So like a big killer app, right? So there is really no must-have application on IoT, right? Um, I don't know if you can, uh, I don't know how many of you can recognize this, this is a, um, something with a fur animal or something, and I, I, I remember this years ago that um, a lot of, for some reason, this was a um, animal that a lot of companies were, a lot of people wanted to buy, so it was all of a sudden become such a big thing, and then it then all, all of a sudden it kind of done went away. So, so this is kind of like a good example, like you know, um, but but it's no longer there anymore. So there's really there's really nothing in IoT that you like you must have. I mean, it's wonderful to have your everything get connected and everything being smart. But you know, we've lived without all this many many years, and you know, like we can still sort of like it's nice to have, but it's not like you know I cannot live without my smart light bulbs, you know, or I cannot live with my Nest thermostat, right? And of course, the personal computers had several of killer applications, right? I mean, because they're still in existence. We had word processors, spreadsheets, because they were useful. Everybody was using it, so um, they're still around, right? And then after the word processors, then came the games, right? So those were, again, very successful, like a huge gaming industry. Uh, and then finally, the web browser, which was absolutely wonderful. Can you imagine anyone having not having a web browser? I mean, that's like, you know, we cannot. Right, and the smartphones had a similar thing. Like the texting was uh, one of the great things, and then of course when we ended up actually having the the um, web browser available in the smartphones, then all of a sudden our smartphones become almost like a computer. Right? I mean, some people actually run their <laughs> their their companies from their smartphones. So again, those are some of the very important um, things that we you know that came within the smartphones. Um, the other on the Internet of Things. Um, some of these, even the most popular apps are not necessarily have to be like, oh, I cannot live without it type of things, right? So smart light bulbs is, is an example, right? So where you have the smart bulbs, I mean, even, you know, like in this room, right? So you have bulbs and changing colors. Like, you know, it's nice to have, but, you know, it's okay to have uh, just a, you know, regular light bulb. Uh, connected speakers, right? Um, you know, nice to have it, but, you know, again, uh, we, can, we can do without. Uh, Nest thermostat. I don't know how many of you actually have a Nest thermostat, um, but again, Nest thermostat is great. But then, actually, one of my colleagues in our university, uh, one of his students and him, uh, actually hacked into the Nest thermostat a few years ago. So again, there's a lot of security uh, issues still there. And again, it's uh, you know you can just basically set the temperature in your house to whatever degree you want, and then then you go to work. Right? So again, like I said, it's just having a not having a lack of pure application is, is a bit of concern, so that's something that I think we should all think about. Um, okay, consumer resistance is another, I think, major problem, right? So here is a here's a um, example. So Stop the Cyborgs launches public campaign against Google Glass, right? Does everyone remember Google Glass? Yeah, we remember, and it was actually a successful technology. It was, it was really very much working technology. It was successful in that sense. However, because the consumers were not bought, bought into it, it actually, it failed. It failed in the most terrible <coughs> way, and it just went away. And one of the reasons is that, um, was that the, it was considered that um, perceived privacy issues. So people, well, and apart from the fact that people didn't like the way it looks, it made you look geeky, it did not make you look whatever way, uh, that's one thing, but then uh, major, many of the people were worried that, you know, when you see someone talking to you with a Google Glass, they were concerned, like, is this person recording, you know, recording me, you know, taking a video of me? Is the recording video and actually, you know, recording my conversation, right? And you know, and so then all of a sudden people start getting panicky and then worrying about those privacy issues. And they finally, you know, again, like I said, I mean, imagine this public actually, you know, making um, efforts against certain technology can make that technology fail, even if that that particular.
particular application, particular technology was very successful in, in the first place. So uh, another one is this uh, Juicero connected uh, juice maker, right? So <laughs> um, the customers actually didn't like this at all because it turns out that um, I think that because the company can actually remotely disable the functionality. I, I believe like if you put um, if you put these juices, these pockets of juice um, extractions into the machine and if they're like over eight days old or something like that, it just basically remotely stops it. So you cannot actually make juice out of it. Um, so again, this is one of those companies people are, uh, are very upset about and, and so it was a, again, big failure and I think this company is probably on its way to being out of business very soon. So as you can see, um, there's a lot of uh, you know applications where even though technology was successful, um, because the customers were not bought into it, so as a result, it fails. Everybody has to, in some ways, in order for technology to move forward, um, you know, to the next level. Okay, the business challenges, business model challenges, right? So, how many of you recognize this? Several of you, right? I, I love this machine. I mean, we all we all seen it, right? Um, our mothers have it, probably, who had their mothers. I mean, my certainly my grandmother uh, in Turkey had one, and to the best of my knowledge, it still works, right? And uh, so these are these have been six incredibly successful machines in the sense that they work so beautifully and so successfully, and it's so good that it still works after 60, 70, 80 years, right? But it's wonderful for the customers, but again, this is like, it's not a great model because the, these machines can last for decades and decades and decades. Good for people who buy them and send it over to generations, but is it good for the company? I think not, right? So the company will go out of business because you just there's no really reselling things. So um, on the contrary to the Singer steering machine, the Gillette model is though amazing. Right? Everybody wants to actually look at that and actually make, make you know, like kind of um, build their model, uh, you know, similar to this. Like for instance, this one, the company gives away the razor for free, right? But then it sells you the place. So you have the razor, which you get so happy, I got the razor for free, but now I have to keep buying these great lasers, which only fits the NASA, so now I have to, so you can you imagine how much, you know, continuous <coughs> revenue is there, right? So it's like a constant flow of income, right? And the blades are not cheap, and you have to keep trading, right? So I think these are, you know, compared to the singer, this is actually a very successful business model where you actually encourage people to, you, you kind of make that need and, and, and then make sure that those, those needs continue to come and, you know, continue to make um, income to the company. Um, so, so there, again, the, there are some IoT variation here, so we can, like I said in the previous uh, example, you can either give away the hardware or you, you sell it very, very cheap to the customer, and then, um, but then you make the hardware useless without associated uh, you know, software services, right? So if you do that, okay, so you, you, you have the hardware, but if you have the hardware and if, if you don't have the software to work on it, then what good is the hardware, right? So would, it, would the customer like it? Like, not necessarily, right? And uh, not only that, but as a, if you think about uh, connecting them and making them to actually integrate into an existing system, it makes it very difficult to integrate into a, a system where you keep uh, your other devices in. Or you could uh, make a business on collecting and monetizing customer data. Gosh, does the company do that? I mean, companies do that. I guess we should really count the companies who doesn't do that. <laughs> That's a better way of doing that, right? So, do we like it? Do we like our, our information being, you know, captured and sold for third party? You know, how many of us like to actually get these phone calls and you're like, I'm not interested in your product. How in the world did you get my phone number, right? And um, so one way of actually, uh, I found that uh, one way of, um, making sure that they don't call you back again, you have to be very rude to those people on the phone. And then you say, you never ever call this phone number again, and then sometimes it, it works. Right, but you know, 
it's it's how how do we get our cost, you know, how do we get our data and, and how do the how these companies get our data and, and solve it for monetary purposes, right? So this is definitely number one, privacy creation of number one privacy issues. Your com the company that is actually collecting your data and, and selling it and making monetary rewards for that. Um, now the question is, can the value for privacy be exchanged to be a reasonable business model? Now again, like I said, as I kept saying, you know, obviously the customers have to like the product. The customers have to feel good about the product. And also the, the you know, the, um, the companies have to obviously create revenue. But can we actually find a way that keep both parties happy, right? Um, yes, we can. If the both sides, they give uh, their informed consent. So if you're willing to share your private information for a uh, exchange of um, services, then it's fine, but it has to go both ways. It is not good, it is not cool for companies to actually you know, capture information without your knowledge. And you know, but if you can say, okay, I'm willing to give this information for, or I'm willing to give this much of privacy information for this service, but I'm not willing to give that privacy from you know my privacy. So, so can we actually do some kind of a trade-off? Like, I'm willing to give this much, but not this much type of thing, right? So it has to be, it has to be somehow balanced. <coughs> All right, um, day two problem. So as I mentioned, what is day one? Day one is the part where you actually have your wonderful system. Now it's you know delivered and it's hooked up in your system, uh, in your in your um, existing place. And now you know you have like start using it, right? It's like the software engineering I teach, right? We say okay, you have this acceptance system. The customer gets your device, your your software. It's incorporated into their system, and now it's like okay, now it gets into the internet space. And again, it's a, it's a similar thing here. So in system administration, they call this a day two problem. So they refer to actually all the challenges that come after a certain technology has been adopted by the, by the users, right? So now I have all this wonderful thing. Now let's see if, you know, let's make it work. Does it work? What kind of things can you do? But most people don't think or, um, or doesn't think very carefully about how to handle several issues. Uh, again, once you get into the maintenance, then certainly you will have maintenance issues. Um, for instance, again, as I mentioned a, a while ago, let's say that you found this IoT device, let it be a, you know, I don't know, anything, smart light bulb or any, anything else, or a teapot from a company, let's say in a very small company somewhere in Europe, uh, you're all happy, you know, it was, it was a good um, purchase, and you used it for some time, but all of a sudden, for whatever reason, the company goes out of business. Now, what do you do with that? What do you do with your, with your IoT devices, right? So how are you gonna maintain it? Um, how, you know, how are you gonna have updates if that company doesn't actually provide updates to it? Or if the company doesn't exist, then what do you do with it, right? What if, the, what if the, um, your device becomes too old and obsolete and it's no longer working? Um, how do you deal with failures, right? How do you deal with system failures in that respect? So there's a lot of uh, issues that actually uh, there is still unanswered with all these uh, IoT devices once they actually be are in a, you know in, in operation. Okay, so um, again, as I think earlier, I mentioned that uh, how we can actually consider some of these challenges. So I mentioned earlier we need a system, right? So that's that's still very true. We do need a system. In fact, earlier we were thinking that each of the things that we are um, having these uh, different IoT devices will be independently connected to the internet, right? Which sounds great, but if you think about it, how are you going to manage all these things? Like you know, a bunch of and so many of them connected to the internet. I mean, like can you imagine this? This is going to become a special management nightmare. I mean. First of all, if you have, let's say, okay, so everyone has a laptop, everyone has a desktop, right? So you have, um, you know, you have to actually change your passwords and it's so open, right? But that's like one laptop and one desktop, right? But if you have 10 other devices or 20 other devices that are connected to the internet, 
and, and in order to keep them secure, and, and you know, so you have to probably change the password on those things as well, right? And some of these devices are actually very difficult to change the password. So again, do you want to have the same password for all 20 devices? The answer would be no, big no, right? I mean, that's like the easiest thing to do, but that's like the easiest way to getting into getting hacked, right? You know, getting your security breach. So imagine 20 passwords, and these 20 passwords has to be redone every so often. Uh, our university is actually is really freaked out now, and we are having this three hand way shaped uh, security thing, and it, it's really crazy. And uh, and it actually, you know, it's, it's now become more a little bit more secure, but then it becomes a little bit uh, difficult sometimes to use things. So you know. Just managing this whole entire like number of numerous devices is, is truly a, a nightmare. Um, and of course, as a result, we can say, well, in order to, instead of doing that, we could actually integrate them into manager as a system, which kind of make things a bit easier. So that means we have to think about some uh, common user interfaces uh, where we can um, <coughs> keep them as a, a you know part of a device, and then you know we could actually have much much more easier updates uh, for these. And of course, that that also brings up the fact that, you know, the commercial entities are highly motivated to push their own system. Um, certainly, this is important, but I think um, we have to have a system not because, though, these big guys are want to push their own system. We really do need a system, right? But again, remember when I said we need a system, but there's going to be competing systems with that, right? So as a result, of course, Google wants everyone to use Google Home. Amazon Alexa, Amazon wants their system to be the uh, gluing factor and so on and so forth, right? Um, and that's great, but again, um, the problem with it is the fact that um, the competition of these providers really create this incompatible walled gardens. Like you cannot really, you know, you kind of have to go with one system, you cannot really have this heterogeneous devices and so on. And I think personally, of course, I'm speaking from an academic research perspective, it's difficult for us as an academic researcher to, to, do, um, to do research on these systems because a lot of times they, these companies prefer to keep their system logic on their own premises. So the data they're collecting actually goes back to them. Ideally, you know, in an ideal system, ideal situation, you want these data to be collected by these devices to come to you, not go back to the companies, right? But that's not the world we live in, so you know, so they actually have the data and that they can do things with it. But as, the as far as the research goes, uh, it just makes it very difficult because of the fact that when the functionality is actually locked down to the system and it's difficult for us to actually um, make improvements on top of what they're, what they're doing. Uh, okay, moving on to uh, other challenges within that uh, domain. Unpatchable systems, right? Again, as I mentioned earlier, so um, when you were talking about actually IoT devices that are being bought and sold cheaply, uh, that's actually almost like um, impossible to keep the security or privacy in place. Uh, the, the example I gave here is the IoT picture frames, right? Um, we want them to be cheap, right? How cheap? Maybe let's say they should be twenty dollars per per IoT picture frame, which is reasonable. But what does that mean to the manufacturer? So maybe the manufacturer makes like twenty percent, twenty five percent at most of that price. So manufacturer maybe makes four dollars out of this, right? Imagine uh, for a for a um, device like that. Do you think that they're gonna put their best and greatest engineering team to put together a system to make sure that it is secure, make sure it's updatable, maintainable, and you know you can run these patches on it? Yeah, we can dream on, right? <laughs> so that's actually one of the uh, examples where um, you, you know, you have this really economical, cheap IoT devices, but when it comes to actually security aspect of it, they are just simply, um, it just simply doesn't exist, right? Uh, and also, there's no incentive for companies, for those kind of small companies to provide software patches. Uh, and again, um, once the product is sold, the product is sold. No one cares about the security aspect of it. No one cares if it actually gets, um, you know, people lose their privacy and, and you know, things like that. 
and, uh, and companies go out of business then, well, it's too bad. Um, but then the devices still stay around, right, for us to ponder about, like, what do we do with it, right? So do we just take them out, throw them out, and start something new? Again, what's the value in that, right? So I'm not saying, you know, we want to keep our devices for, you know, 50, 60 years like our secret machines. It's not the point here, but really, we do not want to buy a device and use it for a few months and spend all this money and, and cost and then to be hacked and then, okay, so now we have to start all over again. Right, in fact, um, in October 16, there was a major distributed DOS attack by discovering unpatched software devices with default passwords. There you go. Uh, in fact, this is the, the you know, uh, figure where you have all these red spots. So these are places where this kind of happened and it's unfortunate that it's in US, <laughs> right? So as you can see from your, your very cheap, very economical IoT devices, this huge amount of privacy, uh, you know, security issues can happen just because you cannot, you know, deal with the um, patching. You know, these are unpatchable systems. Okay, so, um, so then the question becomes, who is going to solve the IoT challenges, right? So. Um, as I mentioned earlier, so we have academic researchers, we have industry people who actually work on system standardization, we have society, government, all, all, all uh, part of the stakeholder here, right? Uh, but in my opinion, again, um, there are some topics that are better suited for commercial um, enterprises, such as developing attractive hardware. Um, I don't know about new people in academia, but you know, we don't really think about the attractiveness of the hardware when we're developing them. I'm personally a software researcher, but I know that my colleagues who develop hardware, they develop nice hardware and it works, it has functionality, but they are far from being attractive <laughs> by any means, right? So, so academic researchers, we are not really interested in you know, making things attractive. So the companies, the commercial companies, they look for doing that. Uh, creating and maintaining systems, I mean, Again, what's fun in that? You know, it's, it's just sort of, it's, it's not really attracting to the academic researchers. So we want to be innovative. We want to come up with innovative ideas, algorithms, and things like that that make things work logically. But we are not really interested in maintaining things. Even when I uh, actually teach software engineering classes, I always tell my students, you know, the developers, you know, I said, who wants to be a developer? Who wants to be a maintainer? Maintenance uh, programmer is like, no one wants to be a maintenance programmer because they're like, what's fun in that, right? It's just, it's not, it's not exciting, it's not developing, it's not designing systems. So maintenance, um, but having to say that it's not an easy job. You know, maintenance can be a very difficult thing. Uh, so again, I think the commercial companies are good at that and they are, they're happy to do it. Um, and standardization of the protocols. Now, I put that in there because it's not to say that as an academic researchers, we are not interested in standardization. We all are, because eventually um, it helps us to improve our protocols that we come up with to, to work and to you know, last longer and, and, and be you know, scalable and all of that good stuff, um, and, and, and make more portable and whatnot. But then we are not really interested in actually really doing the greedy details of standardization because I mean, my protocol can run on a standardized protocol versus un non-standard protocol. So you know, so for me, it's not as big of a you know big deal in some ways. But standardization, I think, is an important aspect, and I think companies are going to be more invested in doing that, right, uh, than I think academic researchers. Okay. So now, having said that, what I think that there are some topics. Uh, that are better suited for academic research, right? So as I mentioned, innovative, interesting, uh, networking protocols, uh, because we can, you know, we have the luxury in academia that we are not driven by market pressure. We are not trying to, we are driven by conference deadlines, very true. <laughs> we want to make that paper, you know, finish and complete for a conference, but we're not really, don't have that market pressures of compatibility, right? So as long as our protocol, I mean our, our algorithm that we develop is actually compared to the best and the greatest in current literature, and if it outperforms us, we're happy, you know, we're very happy and we submit to all these great conferences, LCM, Lopan, and whatnot. 
info come and all these big places, and we get our papers and journal papers and stuff. But we are not really have that pressure of that. And existing diplomas, again, because in academia, we don't really um, look into, you know, we don't really focus on that. Um, however, the other applications have a high societal value, but not immediate profitability. Because uh, as a, again, as an academic researcher, we're not looking into profitability, but we are interested in creating things that can actually have higher societal value. Uh, for instance, um, again, I know there's a lot of uh, researchers from the US, so uh, National Science Foundation is one of our major research uh, institutions where they actually provide uh, research funds to academics. And one of the criteria of those funded research projects, you have to say the broader aspects of the things that you're proposing to accomplish if you receive that particular funding. And the broader impact is essentially is all about how are you helping the humanity? How are you helping the society, right? And that's a major thing because you can have a beautiful technology aspect, the intellectual merit of the proposal, but if you have like a paragraph of a societal impact, then let me tell you, your proposal is not gonna be accepted. I've been in those panels. The societal impact is greatly valued in academia, and in fact, we are driven by that. We are not driven by market pressures, but we are really interested in actually making a difference in, in people's lives. So, uh, so the studies on the value of I IoT, um, I feel like basically we need to look at the realistic modeling of the values and costs to the user. Again, the companies may not necessarily have the time or the inclination to do that, but I think in, in academics, we can actually look into these things much more carefully and provide actually some um, studies that can actually help companies to uh, make certain decisions. For instance, the value of service versus the value of information, time saving and convenience. Now, let me get back to the smart light bulb that we talked about, right? Um, if this, let's say, if, the, if we can say, if we can somehow actually, like, let's say, measure some of these value in dollar amounts, for instance, we can go back and, and say, if you have this IoT device, in the long run, in this like next year or the next 10 years, you're gonna save this much time savings or this much monetary savings, then I think you know people will be more, they'll be better informed as to whether is it really makes sense for me to particularly purchase these uh, devices. For instance, with this light, uh, smart light bulbs, let's say that it saves us, uh, I don't know, um, let's try to be maybe um, conservative and let's say it's going to save us one hour of our time per, per month or, or per week, let's say per month, right? One hour per month is not a trivial amount, right? So then, you know, you're thinking about like, how many hours does it help me to save in a year? How many, how many, how many hours does it help me in the next ten years? And I don't know if you put a some dollar amount to your hourly. You know, if you say I'm worth my time is worth fifty dollar an hour, or if you say my time is worth hundred dollar, I mean, I guess you can, you know. <laughs> I mean, I guess if you look at your salaries, you can say how much hours I work and this is my time. Then, you know, this 50 to $100, you know, you can save a huge amount of money, right? So basically, if we could do something like that and say, okay, so if you actually have this system, you will be able to save this much money and this much time, then maybe these people are going to be better informed about it. And the companies might actually uh, use that information to, to um, extend their market share, right? Uh, in fact, I'm kind of interested in looking at some of those things and actually doing this um, measuring, uh, measuring the value of the, uh, associated with these uh, devices. And cost of privacy, attention span, loss of time. So again, how do you how do you look into uh, cost of privacy versus the value of information? In fact, we um, we had a, a very recent um, conference, not conference. Um, um, magazine article in Nitrogen Communication uh, that just came up where he discussed the value of information versus the cost of privacy within the IoT domain. So I'm, I'm really interested in looking at some of those things in a more, uh, you know, meaningful way. Um, on the other hand, individual companies 
and, and I'm interested in actually looking at several devices and actually make studies and saying that if I have, if I create this, you know, a smart, intelligent home, this is how much savings I'm going to have and so on and so forth. But of course, we have the luxury and the time to be able to do that, but the companies won't do that, right? Because the companies are going to say, here is the Google Home, buy all the Google Home products, right? So because they're not going to be able to um, give that really thorough assessment. So they will have a conflict in press. So, you know, obviously um, doing something like this would make only sense in academic settings, uh, in my opinion. So um, some, these are some of the work that uh, my group has done. I'm not going to really talk about them. I just wanted to tell you that this is our uh, newly accepted Globecom 2017 paper. Um, I had my uh, undergraduate uh, research student, Alex, uh, who was uh, our, we were hosting him as part of our NSF RU grant in summer of 16, uh, actually helped us um, with some of our um, security and, and privacy aspects of the um, our Android phones and he actually hacked, actually worked on the Android OS and made the changes in Android OS where we can actually do um, a steady value of uh, transaction by transaction, um, you know, um, privacy issues. And then this is the paper that uh, I just mentioned that uh, we just came up in 2017. This is actually, I believe I have the uh, camera ready on my website if you're interested in looking at that. So this is a very um, general article and it's, um, it's not terribly technical, so I think it kind of um, has some of the issues and some of the things that I uh, talked about here is already presented in this particular work. Uh, so we are very, very interested in looking, my group is very interested in looking at the value of information, measuring it to the cost of privacy. Uh, we have done actually this type of things within the sensor network so we're trying to apply it to the IoT domain. And, uh, and I think with that, I am out of time. So I just want to thank you all for listening. And I'm more than happy to uh, entertain questions, discussions at this point. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Kamiya. We open the floor now for questions. Anybody has a question? I can just pass the mic. Yes, let me start from the discussion. Thank you, Damna. That was a really nice keynote, and I really appreciate that you looked at the various angles, like um, academia versus industry. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I, I agree with actually most of your points for sure. Um, the academia won't drive the application. Um, uh, who will own the systems? It's a very important question, and I agree that companies can do that because they have a certain interest there. Mm -hmm. Um, academia will have a hard time. So what do you think, what, what role could IEEE play, or like other standard bodies, mm -hmm. not standards for the protocols, but for uh, system architecture? Do you think, because usually IEEE focuses more on the protocol. Uh, actually, that's a very, very good question, uh, Captain. I don't really have a very quick answer to that. I think that's still a very open question. Uh, and it's the same thing when you talk about the cloud computing, right? When you're talking about the data, who owns the data, right? There's still these discussions about, like, okay, so it's my data, but it's being maintained by someone else. So do I own the data, or who owns that? So it's, it's the same issue that is happening here. Um, but. It's really hard to say who's going to be fully on the, on the system. I think it's going to be probably somewhat a shared ownership in some ways because I don't think that it makes sense for, you know, one particular entity to own it, right? Just like if I was saying there has to be some trade-off, right? Um, the company cannot win fully. And, you know, in, and obviously we've seen applications where the companies fail greatly uh, in various applications because the customers are not happy with the product. Um, you know, so as a result, I think we have to find a way to sort of find some shared ownership of the system in a way. And in, in many ways, I think everyone has to work together and do their parts. But I just don't know, I, I just don't imagine like one person or one entity sharing or, or actually like owning the system fully, in my opinion. But again, you know, I have different opinions, so 
Um, in particular, I think IEEE will be very um, helpful in the standardization. I haven't personally been very involved with the standardization, but I, I do salute IEEE people who are truly doing <coughs> help and uh, working with companies. And in fact, I salute a lot of the faculty who are really heavily involved with the standardization of the protocols, which are important actually. And, and that does not necessarily get faculty a paper, you know, but those people are interested in giving contributions to that is going to eventually be um, able to do greater good in some ways. But um, but for who owns the system, is it still, in my opinion, a very open question. Uh, I have another question. Um, sure. So your applications were very consumer oriented. Mm -hmm. um, what about the industrial internet of things, whatever, IIoT? Um, so you know you have SCADA networks, and the, the attacks you describe, like for instance, someone washing my car, or whatever. But think about taking out the smart grid or polluting your water. Like that's much more scary to me. So do you think the challenges you described are pretty much the same, or is is IIoT completely different from IoT? I don't. I mean, I personally have not really looked into the IoT that much, but I imagine it will probably share similar um, similar challenges. But I think the challenges with the IoT might be a little bit higher scale, right? Because when we talk about the smart grid, we are talking about all of us and not just individual person, but we're talking about everyone is connected to that smart grid, right? So in and in a way it's gonna be easier to hack into and affect even more people by by you know hacking into that particular application. So I think it's just gonna in my opinion it's just gonna get worse actually. Um, of course I'm I did talk about most of like individual consumer thing, but I'm just actually even more scared when it comes to the IOT because then it's I think the effects is just gonna be even scaled more further up um, on that. But certainly I'm sure there will be some um, specific challenges to, to that particular field only versus the consumer one for sure. My question is kind of a follow-up to that. So when you when you talk about things like security and privacy, should we even think about IoT separately from these other networks like uh, you know social networks and smart grid and vehicular networks? Is it the same kind of problem that that we are dealing with? And therefore, maybe we should not we should think about those problems at a more global level as opposed to at IoT level. Um, certainly, I mean, when we talk about IPT, I, I did talk about more the consumer devices and things like that, but um, definitely, I mean, I think my, uh, I try to give a little bit like needing a system, and I was looking more on the system that actually connects the devices, but at the end, those devices, again, will get connected to even a bigger system, right? Um, so, yes, there will be, they are going to be part of that. I mean, when we talk about vehicular network, um, you know, when we talk about self, you know, uh, self-driving cars, and all those things then they are certainly bigger systems and IoT will actually play a part within them. I did not specifically look into, you know, the you know, um, how those with how what kind of additional challenges would be in that, but I think my sense when I'm having the system, we can just say the system could be part of a bigger system of what you're just saying. Uh, but I have not really looked into those individual problems, but you're perfectly right. I mean, it's not just about, you know, one or two devices or ten devices that everybody's connecting is, is a problem. I mean, it's going to be, you know, when you, when you put them in a bigger system, the problems are just going to escalate further. Uh, but the idea is that um, we have to think about the system problems. I mean, um, what I talked about is a smaller system, but if you put them in a bigger one, then there will be even further uh, compatibility issues with other things, and, and I think that's when the standardization has to come in, you know, uh, into play furthermore, right? Um, yeah. So I absolutely agree. So that's I think that's like the next um, step to what I was talking today. So absolutely. No, so there's there's a huge number of open problems uh, that I think a lot of us continue to solve, and all these uh, young researchers. I mean, there's there's huge amount of open, very exciting problems still to be so and that's why I think this is a very exciting area. Never a dumb moment. <laughs> more sure. uh, thank you Professor for such a knowledgeable speech. Uh, my question is related to privacy issue. Mm -hmm. uh, what I see about myself is later in IP based smart word. I will be encircled by my something uh, I 
I'm talking about some social marketing or e-marketing. So I will be encircled by the things which I like, which I recently searched. So wherever I will go, they will follow me. So don't you think they are limiting my thoughts, my, I, they are encircling around me. So how about this challenge? Uh, I'm not sure if I understand your question. Um, so, uh, as we can see uh, recently, like whatever we search on Google, right. so, so social marketing, e-marketing follows us. So oh, okay. we encircle us what we like or what we recently search. So what do you think about it? I mean, okay, so this is essentially what we just talked about, you know, the companies um, looking at what you purchase, like Amazon, right? I mean, um, Amazon actually looks at what you purchase and they try to, the next time you're purchase something, you see, oh, you know, these are the things you might be interested in, right? And Netflix does the same thing. I don't know, most of you don't have Netflix, right? You know, you rent uh, videos and, and things, and the next time so you might be interested, because you rented this one, you might be interested in that, right? Uh, I think it's just kind of uh, becoming like a norm, right? Uh, so again, but the problem is, I think, I see that there's not very much we can do about that, right? So like, are we gonna stop using Amazon because they will look at our purchases and give us um, you know, they follow us around, but again, like, it would be nice in the ideal world that they, um, you know, use some of the data that they are collecting on the customers to, to you know, send back the customers in a way and not really use it for fully monetization purposes, but um, it's really hard to say. I mean, you know, it's, but the problem is that it's, it's very little that we can control on those things. Um, but again, um, as you see with the Google Glass, right? I mean, if actually majority of the public goes against it, you can actually kill the technology, even when it was successful. So I think unless a huge amount of people will get together and say, okay, we are not gonna allow this to happen, and then we can kill an app, we can kill a an, an technology. But I think until that happens, um, it's going to be up to the consumer if you want to use a particular service and you just kind of have to give up this thing. But I think what I'm interested in saying, can we find a way to uh, educate people? Because I think a lot of times people don't even know what they're giving up, right? Uh, so if you can educate them, okay, you are giving the service, but this is how much it's costing you in terms of privacy. I think if people know about this more, and I believe they will make more intelligent decisions, whether they're number one, they go, oh, well, that's how it is, right? I mean, people simply need to have more, in, you know, they have to understand the privacy more so that they can make that choices for themselves. Uh, at least that's, I think privacy is very important, and I think it could be a need to sort of look into those ways in which to, not only educate people, but try to find ways to have people make those decisions for themselves. Thanks a lot. <coughs> Thank you for the interesting presentation. Uh, you said that the connectivity issues are basically solved because we have all that awesome wireless dark Bluetooth and stuff. But I'm, I'm afraid, isn't that where the walled gardens actually start? Because for this thermostats, the one has wireless LAN, the other one has Bluetooth, then there is Zigbee, Z-Wave, proprietary protocols and stuff. So if I'm buying one product and then another one, they're mostly not compatible in any way. No, actually, okay, so I think you might have misunderstood me. I, I said the connectivity to internet issues are solved. Uh, what I did not mean that the connectivity issues among the devices are solved. And in fact, you're absolutely right. There's a huge amount of compatibility issues and there's still to be, I mean, you know, definitely there, there is an existing problem. So, uh, but the connecting them to the internet is actually what I meant, has no problem at all because of the Wi-Fi and LTE and the Bluetooth. But absolutely connecting different IoT devices with different uh, technologies are still very much a problem, absolutely. One more question. I'd also venture to disagree that interconnectivity to the internet is, is solved. It's solved in big cities where people have lots of money. If you look at the rural areas, big farms in Texas that are 100 miles by 100 miles, uh, some of these devices have Wi-Fi that, la that reaches about six feet. Um, the connectivity is not solved in some of those uh, areas where rural or developing world can't afford to have the technology, there's no cell tower near them. So you'll still need to, this combination of different technologies in order to get to somewhere that has the internet connectivity. 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, when I say the issues are solved, I'm assuming, I mean, my assumption was that once you have an access to Wi-Fi or, or LT, then there's no problem, but absolutely you're right. I mean, there are, um, even, in, even in rural areas, you know, where we have, um, you know, if you don't have a base station nearby, then you still, like, you know, have problems. So then that's why people switch from different uh, carriers, right? Um, so, but my assumption was that because we have the uh, we have the access to these technologies, and because of that, there's no really real issue. Uh, if you'll be able to manage to get Wi-Fi and coverage in those areas, then it won't be an issue. But what you're saying is a different uh, different problem. Follow up to that yeah. is that if <coughs> like I've been at conferences where you can't get a Wi-Fi connection <laughs> in the room. Right? Um, or, yeah, or all my IoT devices <coughs> are sending whether or not the light bulb is on or whether the water bottle is full of water, and then my children can't call me on Mother's Day or Father's Day. So we got to. Yeah, but, I mean, there are, I'm not, I mean, okay, so um, yes, I agree. I mean, the, I, it's, it's frustration for all of us, I think, but I think that's more of the problem of like, you know, the bandwidth issues. Uh, and sometimes it's you know, like, yes, the conference has two hundred fifty people, and you know, like, the people are just not them to make and then the quality of service degrades as it was and I, I sort of totally agree with you. But uh, but definitely there are all these issues but I think my 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 talk was more on the my thinking was that like there's no challenge enough challenge for us as the researchers about oh let's come up with a new communication protocol to connect the devices. I think that's what I meant to say there. But I, I definitely agree with what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. So I come from the industry from industry, what I really want to know is what are the immediate steps to be taken in collaboration between industry and academics to solve such issues and to create such systems? Okay, so that's a, that's a good question actually. Um, and I think um, it, it's not easy to, um, to have the industry and academia to work um, hand in hand because expectations are rather difficult, right? Industry, you are trying to solve a problem, you and try to solve a problem in the fastest, quickest, quickest way, and you don't necessarily worry about many other things. But in academia, we worry about other things. Um, so, and you know, we have PhD students who need to come up with novel protocols and, and you know, have their publications and things like that nature. So the expectations are a little different, the end product, so it makes it a little bit difficult. Uh, but I think um, a lot of, like for instance, NSF has funding specifically for put, put, uh, putting the academia and industry researchers together. So there are some opportunities where they can kind of work together uh, in solving a problem. So, uh, but in general, if you have like an industry funding, um, you have deliverables, right? And, and, and companies are interested in the product. They're not necessarily interested in papers and such, or, or most of the companies I say, I'm sure some companies do, but um, because of the expectations is different, makes it, it's it make it a little bit of a roadblock uh, in terms of companies and academia to work hand in hand. That's why I try to um, say that there are certain aspects of some of the certain problems are better focused on individuals like companies versus academia. And then at some moment, obviously, we're going to try to merge back together. But in general, it hasn't been a very easy thing to do. And of course, some people have been more successful than others. But it's, it's a different challenge in itself, I think, to putting academia and industry together, or, or, you know, in general. What's ideal is to have a collaboration because industry should drive academia and then vice versa to solve problems. I think bigger problems have to be solved in hand in hand because the customers we get are the service provider. Mm -hmm. The customers we get want specific solutions. But when I go to academia for these solutions, I will get optimum way of solving them, but not financially optimum. So, right. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah. We do have a different. Uh, we do have a different outcome set. Um, absolutely. Uh, but I think one of the things I think academia can do. Um, it actually goes back to my last slide. So you, as a company, come back to academia and tell us, okay, give us a really, give us this 
really valuable information, measured value of information for us to be able to figure out whether this particular application or this particular device would be, you know, um, you know, I guess, enticing to the customer or not. And we can actually do that independent research. And we can actually provide you, um, you know, a research where it actually tells you, okay, if we do, you know, this product and this can save the, your customer this much time, this much man value, and we will come back to you with it. And you can actually try to, you know, uh, talk to your customers. And because you will not really have time to do that, but as an academia, we can actually do that. And we can certainly write some interesting research papers with that too. So I think that one area, I feel strongly that we can contribute in terms of, you know, coming up with more enticing ways in which applications where the customers would be interested and then companies um, in turn obviously will um, gain from that and, and you know make money on you. I think that's one area that I'm thinking that would be very helpful collaboration. Thank you very much. I'm sure the discussion can continue because Internet of Things is an important actually nowadays research topic and industrial one. I'm sure Krishna has lots of questions because he has IoT company, I know this. That's why he is very interested about it. Thank you everybody for attending the first session. Thank you Damla very much for this nice presentation, nice talk and opening our minds for lots of oncoming actually challenges and issues. I have been working research in IoT for 10 years now. I'm thinking, thinking to change my research because of all these challenges. But of course we will need a solution. And I understand that the main solution will can be actually coming from standardization as you said. Uh, especially for industrial IoT, I think they are working on a special standard for that, which is industry for the standard, something like this. So once we have, I think, the standard, we can know our uh, target and we, we can target it better.